Welcome to episode 256 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing producer Mark Stolaroff, who just did a film called Driver X. Mark is a very experienced producer in the low budget arena. He's got a lot of great advice for screenwriters, so stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving me a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 256. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I'll teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and career letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. Quick few words about what I'm working on. Um, on my crime thriller feature film, The Pinch, we have officially launched on Amazon, and hopefully by the time you listen to this podcast, we will also be available on iTunes. If you want to do me a big favor, please do watch the movie and write a review on these various platforms, especially with iTunes and Amazon. Um, on Amazon, especially, if you, um, if you give it a nice review, that's how it gets into the algorithm, and you get recommended to other people that are watching your film. And this is especially true with Amazon Prime because people are not paying to watch the individual film. They're paying for the subscription to the service. Um, so if you get a lot of recommendations, that's how your film can really take off. Again, on Amazon Prime, if you do Amazon Prime, you can watch the film and there's no additional charge. It's just all part of your Amazon Prime subscription. But also, if you don't do Amazon Prime, you can still watch it through Amazon. You just have to pay a few bucks for it. Um, and again, giving me those reviews really does help. So I would really, really appreciate it if, um, if you have a minute. If you want to watch the film and give a review, be very much appreciated. You can also buy the pinch on selling your screenplay um, through my website so if you're interested in seeing the film that is actually the preferred way for me just because I don't have to do then a, a revenue split with Amazon and iTunes you can just go to selling your screenplay.com slash the pinch and the word the pinch is all lowercase and all one word the other thing that I'm offering on my website and not offering anywhere else is the um, the behind the scenes how to um, webinar that I did um, you can add that to you can buy the pinch through the website and you can also add this webinar I go through go through every aspect of how I made this film from writing the a low budget uh, micro budget script to raising the money through pre-production production and of course post-production so if you're looking to try and do your own micro budget film I think this would be incredibly helpful to you you can obviously watch the film and then you can also watch as I said my three-hour webinar on exactly how I made the film so seeing the two pieces together should really give you a good idea of exactly what can be done on this sort of budget. Um, again, you can purchase that all through my site, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash the pinch. And again, if you use Amazon, use iTunes, please do check out there too. And if you can, please do write a review. Thank you very much for all of that. So now let's get into the main segment. Today, I am interviewing producer Mark Stoloroff. Here is the interview. Welcome, Mark, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. I'm very happy to be here. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, well, I, I'm an old person, so my background is, goes way back. <laughs> um, I uh, grew up in Houston, Texas. I um, mute that. Uh, I back before, you know, when when, you know, your dad went out and shot home movies on eight millimeter and um, not before videotape. And I think that's probably what gave me the bug was that my dad liked to do that a lot. He was a lawyer, but he was a very he was a big camera bug. And um, we used to sit, you know, in the living room and watch Super 8 movies. And when I was in in uh, high school, I started making little Super 8 movies to uh, instead of book reports. That was that kind of thing. And this was in the late seventies and early eighties. Um, and then when I got to college, I went to the university of Texas. I thought about the idea of film, but this was 1983 and there wasn't an independent, you know, American independent film movement yet. And no one talked about doing that. So I majored in business. 
Um, but I was lucky enough to get into something called the Business Honors Program, which gave me a lot of flexibility. It was a, it was like a prestigious part of the business school, but it gave me all this flexibility. And they have film classes at University of Texas. In fact, they were at that time they were one of the very few universities th- that provided like film equipment to undergrads. And I snuck, I took all the prerequisite classes and snuck over and got kind of teacher consent to be in the film production track of classes and made, you know, 16 millimeter films that were shot on, you know, wind up Bell and Howell cameras and, you know, black and white reversal film. And you'd edit it with a res literally with a razor blade. We weren't, we, you know, at least in film one and, and I made films and, and that's, and I loved doing it. I thought I was good at it. And then I, when I graduated, I, I kind of chickened out again and I did investment banking for a couple of years um, because of this business degree I had. But then um, I went back to Houston. I was in New York for the best making. I went back to Houston and and uh, kind of earned two years of credit with my family or, you know, made a little bit of money. And I, I just decided, you know, to do some more creative stuff. I started a theater with a childhood friend. We ran it for five years. I produced about 40 theatrical productions. A lot of these were, were original shows. We were, our kind of mandate was original shows by local playwrights. Um, I got to do, you know, I got to act. I mean, I'm, I'm not a good actor, but I like doing it. Um, and produce these shows on what I would call a micro budget. These were, these were, this was a small theater, um, very, you know, uh, kind of homemade, um, stuff, but you know, we got a lot of attention and, and then I, I won an internship there and, and worked professionally for, on the first movie in Houston in 1990. Um, as a PA, I was a paid PA on a, on a $3 million made for TV movie. And then, um, eventually moved to Los Angeles in 94, started working at Corman to kind of, kind of get my feet wet. Roger Corman's company I had a friend that was running the studio there and then worked my way up the kind of production track, you know, first AD, uh, I production managed, a, a Academy award winning short film, uh, back then. And then the kind of big experience for me was I was the first person hired by a gentleman named Peter Broderick for a new company that he was starting called uh, Next Wave Films, which was financed by the Independent Film Channel. And we gave finishing funds to exceptional low budget feature films. Um, we gave finishing funds to Joe Carnahan's first film, Blood, Guts, Bullets and Octane, to jo- uh, to Chris Nolan's first film, Following, to Amir Barlev's first film, Fighter, and to some other you know really exceptional films. I worked there for six years from 97 to 2002. And then when the company uh, went under, I guess, or, you know, was when I've seen kind of, you know, closed it down, um, I became an independent producer and produced the only kind of films I really knew anything about, which was micro budget films. I mean, I, 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 you know, had that's the kind of filmmakers I was talking to for six years and looking at their films and the kind of films that I had, I had come to Houston. I mean, come to LA with the idea that I would make clerks myself as a director. That was why I came to LA. So, so that's just, it's always been my thing and, and it doesn't pay the bills t- tremendously well. Um, so I started something called no budget film school in 2005. I teach, uh, no budget filmmaking. It's a very specific thing that I do. Um, it's not about how to make any kind of a movie. It's very specific about how to make a movie with whatever money you have available in your pocket. And, um, at that time, and, um, it's, it's mostly what I do is a two day weekend seminar. Uh, I teach it in, uh, here in LA at Raleigh studios, but I've taught it in other cities around the country, you know, and I do this when I have time. I mean, I actually haven't taught it in a, in a last year and a half or a couple of years because I've been so busy on working, but, um, but I'm looking forward to, uh, getting back, um, beginning of next year and starting to teach again. Yeah. And what's that word you just, the, the name of the teaching company Novus is that what what, it's sorry no budget film school no budget film school okay perfect I'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can just click on over to it so I um, just just want to talk about a few things you just mentioned there Um, so you mentioned working with Christopher Nolan on um, following and some of these other you know real early films for filmmakers that really went on to do some great stuff maybe you can talk about that just a little bit as a producer what were you guys looking for as these i assume these films came in maybe you guys saw a rough cut of them and you said yeah this one looks like something we could put some money into it but maybe you could talk about what what were the films that you guys were choosing and investing in and why were you choosing those films yeah, that's a great question, and it's something I like to. It's kind of a, a whole thing about in my class, a, a discussion about what what is it when you're making an independent film. What is it? What do you need to be thinking about as a filmmaker? Um, um, and I like to first say that that independent filmmaking and studio filmmaking is like like alternate universes. The the rules are exactly 
exactly opposite. So whatever you think you might you should be doing, because you you know because you know a little bit about studio filmmaking, it's probably the opposite of what you should be doing with independent filmmaking. But um, but to kind of get to the real crux of your question, the answer that we gave when we were there, and I still like to say it all the time, is we didn't know what we were looking for. We we were just looking for something different, um, something unique. And um, it's not uncommon to what Sundance was looking for. We took seven of the films that we got involved with to Sundance um, and, uh, and, and five to Toronto. So um, it wasn't about, you know, uh, oh, this is, looks real commercial or it looks great or it shot on 35. Back then, you know, we were looking at films uh, in the beginning of the, uh, of the company. We were looking at films mostly shot on 16 millimeter. And it didn't matter to us if it looked that great or whatever. It just needed to look like what it should look like, you know. And what we were looking for was something really different. And um, uh, Blood, Guts, Bolts, and Octane, which is our first film, um, that, you know, there was a voice there. There was there was manifest talent. That's the other thing we were always looking for. Um, you could tell that this this guy had some talent. I mean, his both writing and directing, there was a real style to it. Um, and he'd made it for like $7,000 before it came to us. So, so he was able to just, you know, kind of conjure out of nothing, something pretty amazing. And then with following, it was a little different story. You, you mentioned, you know, looking at rough cuts, we, we basically, once we planted our flag, people would send us rough cuts on videotape and then eventually on DVD. And we, I looked at probably some part of 2000 movies while I was there, um, and some of them were pretty, pretty rough, pretty, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, as I'm you sure. can imagine, um, people don't understand what bad movies are really like until you, until you do, you know, work for a film festival or do that kind of a job. But, yeah. um, but then you looked at a lot of really good films that you didn't get involved with anyway. And that, and that was, you know, tricky. Um, uh, I mean, we came very close to doing Blair Witch Project, which we actually did just, you know, decide to do. We, we, uh, we'd been looking forward to that film for, for a year and a half and, been talking to them for for a while and then when we finally saw the when the tape finally came in which was before they got into Sundance obviously it was when they probably submitted to Sundance I took that tape I watched it I thought it was terrific I really wanted to do it and it was a but it was a struggle to say oh this is this it wasn't a no-brainer looking at that film because it was not clear if it would get into a Sundance and that was kind of important to us for these kind of films um it, it felt kind of commercial but yet it was very small and not so commercial in a way but um, it didn't feel like an art film, which was kind of a trick. Um, but we ultimately decided let's, let's do it. And, and we were negotiating to try to do that film. And then they got into Sundance and then, uh, somebody on their team came, came up with some money and they didn't need our money anymore. But, um, uh, which was a real boy, that was a, that next summer was rough, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so, so I mean, but Blair, Witch is a good example, a uh, very unique film, um, uh, talented filmmakers, uh, following really unique obviously um the, the structure of, of following was something people hadn't quite seen before and again a, a manifestly talented director which was something that we were really looking for um and that film had actually been finished to 16 millimeter had gone to its first film festival san francisco international film festival before so we didn't get a, a rough cut of that one that was one where peter was on a panel with chris and um it was like how to make a ten thousand dollar movie panel or something and um Peter was like, well, I'd like to take a look at this. It's it's a little after where we get involved with the film, but let, let's take a look. And we, he thought it was terrific. We all looked at it and said, yeah, let's do this. And then we, and we blew it up to 35. We, he got a chance to remix the sound, which he wanted to do. Um, and then we rep all the films that we got involved with. So we, we repped it um, and got it into Toronto and, and then the kind of rest is history for, for that film. I'm curious, and I just want to sort of float something out. You can get your reaction. Um, in sort of the venture capital world, one of the things they always say is we invest in in the people. It's not really the idea or the company. You know, they're much more concerned with just getting to know these talented entrepreneurs. And you sort of are hinting at some of the same thing. I saw a pretty early cut of Blood, Bullets, and Octane, um, and Joe Carnahan was there and got up and did a little presentation. And I was never that impressed with the movie, but I was very impressed with him he just had a big personality he was charming and funny yeah. and just and and i remember thinking then eh, movie was sort of so so at least in my opinion but this guy it's like he's going places because he's just such a big personality you could tell he could you could put that guy in a room and he could sell a project you know to a bunch of development executives how much does that play into your to to this kind of a thing in terms of when you're looking at a filmmaker whether it be a screenwriter director um and, and thinking about getting in bed with them and, and going down this long road of producing a movie how important is that to the project as opposed to just oh wow this guy's written a great script 
Well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't put too much on the kind of, I mean, it's great to have to work with somebody who, who is charismatic and, and articulate and all those things you mentioned and Joe, you know, all that stuff. Um, and I, and, and not to get belabor the whole blood guts point, but I'm curious to see, you know, to know when you saw it and, you know, we saw it at the market at the independent feature film market and, and, um, uh, it was, you know, I, I it, it, to us, it kind of stood out. We looked at, you know, a lot of projects in that market and, um, uh, but, but it, it was less about him, uh, about his personality. Cause we, we, you know, we, we saw the movie without knowing who he was, he was in the movie and you could get some sense of it. But, um, but again, the idea of, of a talented filmmaker, uh, is, you know, in this, in the game of that game, uh, which is trying to like break a, a filmmaker out to the end of the world, which is like what Sundance likes to do and, you know, whatever, um, you know, it really helps to have uh, a filmmaker that where the talent is really manifest and, and they're, they're, it, whether that means it's showy or whatever. I mean, the, the first film we actually got involved with, but we in, ended up not closing the deal was Pi. And that's a perfect example of a very showy filmmaker, you know, Darren Aronofsky, you know, kind of showing off like, look at look at what I'm doing. It's very uniquely shot and and um, again, manifest talent there, you know, and something we hadn't seen before. We pitched that. We mentioned that to IFC. We're like, this is going to be our first film. And they're like, what? I mean, they just they were like surprised. They didn't because it was just such an you know, it didn't feel like a commercial film at all or whatever. And, and we got involved with that film. I worked on it for four months before that, that deal fell through. But hmm. um, but uh, and certainly you talked to Darren. He was an intelligent guy and whatever. But I mean, the filmmakers I've worked with at Next Wave and since they have all kinds of different personalities. I mean, Chris is, a vi- you know, really articulate, very smart guy, but he's not he's certainly not Joe Carnahan in terms of the way he, he you know, conducts himself. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, different personalities. So um, but I think that, you know, when I work, you know, now um, I don't I don't put a lot. I mean, I don't we don't pitch so much. So, I mean, I'm you know, I'm making films with my own financing. Um, that's often my own money. Uh, um, and, uh, I don't have a lot of money and, um, and it's not important that we find somebody who's good in the room kind of a person, but I think, you know, for somebody who's making a million dollar film or, or, you know, we're really going out to, well, certainly if you're going out to production companies, um, not if you're going out to maybe individual investors, but certainly, um, production companies, I think that that's very valuable. But for me, it's, it's not the most important thing. Um, I mean, you want to work with talented people. These films are so hard to make that, Pretty much, you know, if you're looking at something that's made for seven thousand or six thousand dollars, like Falling was, or ten thousand dollars, you know, there's somebody, you know, is probably pretty charismatic and very talented to pull that off. They're doing a lot of different jobs themselves. Uh, they don't have a, you know, a team of people with a lot of experience or talent necessarily, even, and yet their their talent kind of oversees everything and makes it, you know, really great. And I, I don't, I, I mean, because I've been in this world for so long and I've appreciated no budget filmmaking for so long. I really feel like, you know, it's, it's an underlooked kind of people don't quite understand, you know, the, the people are critical and they like to rip on things. And it's like, if you had any idea, you know, what it took to, to do every job on a movie, like, you know, with a lot of these filmmakers do, you know, you know, it's, it's quite the thing. And when you look at Joe and, and Chris in particular, their next movies were both $5 million and, 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 uh, Darren, their next movies were around $5 million they had so they had resources they had they had you know people that were that were you know had had experience that were brought in to help them and they both and the third the second movies of all those filmmakers were really amazing movies i mean narc and um um uh, uh memento obviously and um and i'm blanking on darren's film um uh requiem, you know, for, but, dream. requiem for dream i mean all amazing movies you know and uh and it was to me that wasn't a surprise that these filmmakers would go on with you know with a little bit more money and some and some help and they weren't having to do everything would go on and make something pretty incredible mm-hmm. so yeah so let's dig into your latest I, film driver x maybe to start out you can give us a quick log on or pitch for that film what is that film all about yeah so it's about a a, a, a guy named leonard he's a 50 something uh former record store owner his record store has gone out of business and um he's now at home taking care of his two young daughters during the day his wife uh, works during the day paying the bills and um, he's been trying to get a job in the music business which is his only passion it's the only thing he really knows anything about but he's 50 years old and he's 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 not gonna get a job in the music business um that's kind of run by younger people and um Early in the movie, the wife says to him, you know, we, we can't pay our bills. We, we have a mortgage coming up and, you know, you're going to have to step it up and just get some kind of work. So he goes out and he signs up for uh, DriverX, which is a Uber-like rideshare company and starts driving 
at night um, to help pay the bills. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, the movie, you know, it's it's a yeah, it covers you know rideshare driving and that kind of thing. But really, it's more about uh, getting older, um, uh, starting to feel like you know you're you know, having regrets for lost opportunities, having, you know, starting to, to, to feel like you're now getting older, looking at the generation behind you that's starting to kind of take over the world and, and you're not really ready to hand over the reins yet. Um, it's about, you know, the kind of the, the, what happens when you're that age and, and technology disrupts, uh, your, 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 you know, your work. And now you're having to kind of jump into this new, new world of gig economy and new technology um, uh, what that does to a marriage. Um, we spend, you know, a lot of time with the, you know, the struggle in a, in a, in a long marriage when you've got financial problems and, and you've, and you've lost your mojo. Um, and how do you get your mojo back? And so it covers a lot of ground. Um, and certainly, uh, from the driving side, um, it, it, I'm sure your next question was going to be, where, you know, where did you guys come up with this idea? And I can give you the kind of quick answer to that without even hearing the question. Um, Let's but do it, I've, yeah. I've been, yeah, I've been working with uh, Henry Burial since Next Wave. Um, uh, I got involved. Uh, we got involved with his first feature, which, which was called Somebody. It was shot for three thousand dollars with a two man crew on um, Canon XL ones. And uh, before they submitted it to us, and it was a pretty finished film before they submitted it to us, by the way, they, they got they got almost every bit of it with the three thousand dollars. Our money was basically to we, we to do the post sound, to, which, you know, which they already had pretty good sound mix and stuff. But we did, you know, kind of full on post sound. We, we blew it up to, to film and thirty five and, and did some other things to it. But um, uh, that film premiered in the 2001 Sundance Film Festival in dramatic competition. It was picked up for distribution um, by a lot 47 films. And then sadly, it came out in theaters and then lot 47 went under and it never came out on video. So people don't know about this movie. It was about four years before the word mumblecore had ever been mentioned. And it was essentially that that kind of a movie. It was all improvised. It was a terrific movie. Um, and it's never really been seen since, you know, like 2002. But um, but anyway, we, we I was, a, you know, I joined that movie uh, in post and and um, became part of the team. And then after that, um, Henry, you know, started making films and he and I started working together. And so um, Driver X was our fifth feature. And um, we were working on a bigger budget film. These were all, you know, micro budget films that we financed ourselves. These these uh, five films. And and um, the uh, after our uh, fourth film, which was called The House That Jack Built, which premiered in the Los Angeles Film Festival and was picked up for distribution, is now you can watch it on on Netflix. Um, we were trying to make uh, a horror film that he'd written that was about a million dollar budget. And, um, we were, we had a, a group behind us that were, you know, were, were, they were putting together the financing and it looked like it was going to happen and we weren't taking on jobs. And then that financing fell through and then we, it would come back again and it looked like it was going to happen and it fell through. And so the entire year of 2014, we weren't really working. Um, and he, he has two young boys, his wife works during the day. Um, and he's, started driving for Uber because he needed the money and he didn't have a lot of time during the day to do it. So he would drive at night hmm. and I would stay up late and he would call me in the middle of the night, uh, telling me what ha- these crazy stories that were happening in his car. And if you know anything, if you've ever talked, if you've ever driven for Uber, if you ever talked to your, your Uber Lyft driver, you know that the late shift is the, when the crazy things happen. That's when the drunk people get in your car and, mm-hmm. and crazy stuff happens. And so we, we realized pretty quickly, um, that there was a really, there could be a really great movie in that. And, and it was pretty clear f- for me, from my standpoint, that this is a movie that could be made, you know, very easily on a micro budget. Um, we, without even knowing what the script was going to be, we knew we had the car, which was his car. Uh, we knew if we were going to be dealing with the family and stuff, we would just shoot it at Henry's house. And, um, you know, that turned out to be about 85% of the locations we have. A, it, there's a lot of locations in the movie um, and there, it's a pretty ambitious movie. It turned out to be a pretty ambitious movie. We have over 50 speaking parts. We half of the, probably half the movie is set in the car at night with no money. So we weren't shooting on a process trailer or anything like that. Um, so it was, became, you know, and there are other, a lot of other locations, but, um, but you know, when you kind of reach a critical mass, I would say, um, uh, that, that the car in the house, you know, as far as locations was kind of a critical mass. And then the other critical mass for us was, was who's going to play the lead? And we were friends with uh, with Patrick Fabian. He, he'd been in, our, in one of our other movies. Henry's known him for years. He's played beach volleyball with him for years, and um, we, you know, super nice guy. And 
and and actually I, I I knew he was a good actor and I've seen him on you know all the things he's done on TV and and stuff but I I didn't think he was capable of playing this kind of a part because he's always playing the slick guy in a suit who just has confidence and knows everything and and that's not the part you know and uh, I mean he's a terrific actor he really uh, changed my mind pretty quickly he's I mean I, I can't say enough about Patrick not only his acting but just his uh, how great he is as a person and how you know we wouldn't have been able to make the movie the way we did without someone like that um who just you know really uh totally on board you know whatever you needed him to do kind of yeah. a thing so I'm, I'm curious um so as you guys are developing henry is calling you at night and he's he's telling you about these crazy stories um why did you decide to go the drama route as opposed to you know maybe the thriller or the horror or even the comedy i guess um yeah what was it that that's sort a really of good question and, and a lot of people have gone that route there's been some other uber movies that have come out um sorry uber <laughs> movies that have come out and they've almost all been thrillers um it seems i mean it's thrillers or torture porn you know whatever i um and i'm shocked because when we started shooting this we thought we were we thought there'd be a, a 10 other movies coming out at the same time and they would all be you know dramas and, or comedies or silly comedies or whatever but um so if you go back and look at henry's filmmaking especially somebody it it uh it's his specialty his gift as a filmmaker um is authenticity and both in the writing and in the performances um in in somebody that that was the thing with that movie it 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 um it's so real and you feel like you know those people and you've said those things it's you know it's a very simple story about someone breaking up and then kind of going out on in the dating scene um but that stuff all happened to the lead actress who played the part and henry was like let's get r- as real as we possibly can and we're going to cast some of the same people that played your boyfriend that played your boyfriends in real life are there. We're going to play, have them play them in, in the movie. And so, and not a written word of dialogue because every time they wrote something, it felt, it felt phony compared to the improvisational stuff. So, so that movie succeeded because of its authenticity. And that's really, even though we've done a lot of different kinds of movies, we did a a indie sci-fi film called pig and whatever, there's that feeling of not, you know, of, of it not being phony and uh, not that these films were improvised, but they, mm-hmm. but again, he's very good about getting a natural performance out of actors. And um, so the, naturally the, the thought for him was, I want to make a movie that really, you know, conveys what this experience is like, both at home, dealing with family and kids, with wife and family and kids and, and that kind of thing. And also, cause that was a big part of what was going on at that time for him, you know, the, the struggle to pay the bills and that kind of thing. And then also what was going on in the car and, and, um, and what was going on with him specifically as a nearly 50 year old man driving around millennials. Um, and so, uh, that's just, that's just where he goes. That's his place to kind of, to kind of create something real. And it's funny. Um, I mean, we'd like to call it a, I don't know, comedy drama, 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 drama I hate using the word dramedy, but, um, but th- there's certainly a lot of humor in the movie because there's just funny things that happened to him while he was driving. But, but but the crux of the story is, you know, what happens to you when you reach 50 years old and you don't and you, you your life didn't quite turn out the way you thought it did. And what do you do? You know, and, and are you ready to, you know, push on into, you know, later middle, middle age or are you still hanging on to your youth or, mm-hmm. or whatever? So that that's a drama. Um, and that's where we went with it. So in terms of, um, you just mentioned that um, one of the things you like about Henry's writing is his authenticity. Are there some other things about his writing that you like? And, you know, this is a screenwriting podcast, so I'm just kind of curious just to kind of hear your thoughts on what what do you see in Henry's writing or even other people's writing that you really, really like um, that maybe people don't do as much as they should? Well, it's interesting because... You know, that's a really good question. I have to think about how, like, when I, because I, I do respond, you know, I'm, when we did Pig, there were so many drafts, and I was always so happy to make a note, for instance, and then he would send me back something based on that note that was just great, you know? And it's, and I, I it's hard to maybe define that quality other than, you know, again, I respond to that authenticity too. I, I like to see things I, and I'm not when I'm as a producer looking at a script I'm not so great with the kind of big picture I mean not the big picture I'm not so great with like structure and things like that like giving notes on things like that I I look at moments um does the moment is if it's funny is that is that moment 
it funny? Is it a good joke? Um, was it, was that moment, is that phony? Is it, uh, is that not what that character would do in that moment? Um, that's where a lot of my notes come from. And, um, have I done that before and I haven't seen that written in anywhere or in a movie? I love that kind of moment where you go, wow, that's, that's what people do. And we haven't quite seen that in a movie. And Henry always has nice moments like that in, in, in movie, in his scripts. Um, so, uh, and, and of course I step back and say, is this a film that, that I understand who the audience is and can I deliver an audience to that with no money? Um, you know, can this be made effectively with no money? You know, can I, can I put the small, do I know where to put the small resources I have into the, you know, where it most makes the difference and, and can I get by without other things? You know, these are other kind of things that I look at when I look at a script that I, that I know I'm going to be making on that kind of a budget. But I think that, you know, and, and really, you know, uh, for almost everything I do, not everything, but mostly everything I do, and certainly the things I do with 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 Henry, uh, I've responded personally to that to that material. Um, and they don't; it doesn't have to be about what I'm going through, um, but there's something about it that I connect with personally, and that I relate to, and that I feel like I can, you know, I can give notes that have some meaning because um, because I have a, a, a shared vision with Henry. And, you know, not the same, you know, not the same granular vision, maybe, but a shared vision and, and um, of what this needs to be and, you know, what needs to happen in that scene or whatever. And so I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that really answered your question, but I, I just feel like, you know, Henry's really good with dialogue. He's really good with um, I, he, he does a lot of dramas, but he's actually, you know, writes some really funny stuff. Um, and in this particular case, what was interesting is that he was pulling over. People would say things in the car, and he'd pull over and write them down. There was a lot of things that, you know, that ended up in the script that he, he that people said to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, that that all gets runs through a million filters. I mean, it, mm-hmm. you know, it changes a little bit when he writes it. It changes a little bit when, when it's performed by an actor, and then it, you know, in the editing room. But, but, um, but that's the kind of authenticity we were going for. And I feel like, you know, we've we've screened it for a year at festivals, um, and um, we've had a lot of drivers who've seen it. And, you know, boy, they like, you know, they pick out scenes. They go, oh, my God, that there's the scene after his first night where, you know, they're in the kitchen in the morning and the wife says, well, how did it go? And she asks him a series of questions. And we've had more than one driver tell tell us that's exactly how that went down in their life when the, after that first night of driving. And in fact, she asks him how much money he made. And people, two different people said, I guess exactly, you know, or within like three dollars of what, how much money he made that first night. Mm-hmm. Um you know, that's what, that's what we're trying to go for in a movie like this. So, um, you know, so yeah, I, I guess that's, I guess that kind of half answer your question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's good insight. And I think that will be, um, be valuable for screenwriters to hear. Um, so you've had this longstanding relationship with Henry. Um, and I noticed you have another movie, um, out, um, Devil's Whisper. I'm just kind of curious in general, um, how do you find scripts as a producer? Do you still accept cold queries? Do you have a network of agents that maybe pass you material that they think would be right for you? Maybe you can talk about that because I get a lot of questions about, you know, from, from screenwriters, hey, how can I get to this producer or that producer? Um, and I'd just be curious to get your take on, on how a screenwriter can build a relationship with a producer like yourself. Yeah, I, you know, I I have to I I don't maybe my situation's unique because it doesn't really it's not any of those things so much. I mean I, I mean I'm you know I get your emails frankly. Um, I don't, I, but I'm not looking for material. I mean, often you know Henry and I will spend years on these movies. Um, we this has been a four year journey for us. Um, Pig was like geez like six years or something, and it doesn't mean you're not doing other work. You know, kind of in between. I I I made devil's whisper in between shooting in the middle of shooting driver X. I mean, that film was shot and finished and out, you know, the door and released, you know, in the middle of all the whole driver X experience. Um, uh, because that movie had money and we were able to just kind of shoot it and finish it. And there you go. Um, uh, so I'm, ne- I'm, I'm never looking for material so much. I, um, I mean, working with Henry, he writes, he's a very prolific writer. He comes up with a lot of different ideas and, you know, it, every movie is tough and then we, it's like maybe like, you know, having a baby or something. We're like, oh, I can't do that again. And then, you know, then you look at your cute baby and you're like, oh, I would like to have another baby. And then you, you forget how, you know, hard. I'm not a woman. I don't know exactly how hard it is, but I can only imagine um, being pregnant. Um, but then you go ahead and you have another baby. And so I think that's been what's happened with us, um, even though I think I've also kind of feel like I pulled Henry into no budget filmmaking every time. I feel like he since somebody he's wanted to get out of making no budget films, he, he's you know, that's not his thing. Um, but you know, 
different things happen and you, you know, like a film doesn't, doesn't happen like the horror film and, and what are you going to do? I mean, it's nice to make a movie. And so we end up kind of doing it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I, you know, devil's whisper was not a script I looked for. Uh, Adam rip is someone that Henry's friends with. And I I've known Adam for a long time. I've never been really close friends with him until we started making the movie. But, but Adam knew about my background, came to Henry and said, Hey, I'm, I'm making a, a film that's that we're going to try to do on a really small budget. And do you think Mark would be interested in producing it? And he said, yeah, you know, give him a tr try. And we were in the middle of, you know, again, kind of putting, you know, directs together and, and, um, and Adam's a really charismatic guy. You talk about charismatic guy. He's a funny, smart, charismatic guy. And, and, um, that's not really my kind of movie making the uh, genre movies, but I thought, Hey, let's try it. And, um, and, and make a movie for more money. I, I, I never really, I, I mean, I've been involved with films, like that in, in different capacities, but not as a producer. And so that was a great experience learning how to do that. Um, it wasn't a ton and ton of money, but it was, you know, it was, th there was all the money we needed to make the movie all at one time. I ended up, you know, I think we still have like a couple, you know, like a few grand in the bank, um, you know, now that we were way done with that movie, but you know, we didn't have to spend it all. I mean, that, that's not the experience I have on the movies I do. I never have, I never have all the money. I'm, we shot driver X, um, we shot most of the movie. I hadn't raised a single dollar. I I just had zero percent credit cards, and I just put the money in myself. And we weren't spending a ton of money, but it you know, but it was money. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and then we raised about fifty thousand dollars on Kickstarter as we were while we were editing it, and that was the first money I'd raised in the movie. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so the you know that's how it normally happens. That's why things take so long. Um, and we you know we try to get it right too. We spend our time trying to get, get, get the movie right there. We're in no hurry because we don't have investors and people breathing down our back and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm curious, what's your sort of, and, and maybe you could even answer this for Henry. What is your long-term goal with these micro budget films? Um, are you eventually hoping to have like a breakout hit that then maybe people will coming to you with, with truckloads of money? Um, are you happy just creating these very, as you say, artistic pieces that you don't have people breathing down your back? Yeah, I, it's a little bit of both. I mean, certainly, I don't want to sound stupid and sound, oh, we just do this for ourselves. And of course, we want these films to break out. You know, every film you want to get into Sundance, and you know, and we, our first film was in Sundance. Our second film was a was a Sundance Lab project. Henry was in the screenwriters lab, and then it didn't get into Sundance. And it was very close, actually. I, you know, from talking to John Cooper, um, but it didn't get in. And then, um, and then every film since then has not gotten into Sundance and it, and that's kind of heartbreaking, but it happens to most filmmakers mm -hmm. and a lot of filmmakers who, who played in Sundance. I mean, if you think about it, there's a lot of filmmakers out there. I know a lot of them who submit their films and don't get in. And so, you know, you want that to happen and you want, you know, you want something to break in a kind of a big way and for it to launch maybe some, not some, as much for a producer, but certainly for, for the writer director, you want to get more work. You want to get paid gigs. I mean, Henry would love to be directing television or, or whatever, just like every other independent filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I, my hope is that this film, which is getting a, I guess the biggest release we've ever gotten, um, you know, the most attention we'll get, you know, what we've ever had with, um, IFC films, Sundance selects that, that that will happen. I mean, I, I've always felt like Henry's a really talented guy and, and um, it's kind of silly that he's not doing just working all day long directing television or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. um, so uh, but that, I mean, I can tell you, I could probably give you some theories on why that is. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's not to do with his talent or his personality or that. It's just the, the nature of the business. But um, but yeah, so that you, you certainly do that. But, you know, we're also filmmakers and we like making films. And that year of sitting on our hands, I mean, it was almost a whole year sitting on our hands. That's never happened to either one of us. We just, because we make the movies. We don't, we, they take a long time, but we, we don't sit on our hands. We just, you know, he rewrote that script a bunch of times. We, I was looking for other money. I mean, we did a ton of work. I broke down that script two or three times um, and, uh, and we had nothing to show for it. I mean, mm -hmm. and so it's, we like making movies. I get excited when I, when he started talking about this movie and we started thinking about what it could be and he started sending me pages the same thing happened with pig. I get excited and it's like, okay, I'm going to put my, you know, my producer hat on. How am I, how are we going to do this? You know? And, and, um, I have a, a kind of a way of doing that. And, and, um, and then it becomes fun, you know, I mean, it's not always fun and it's, it's very hard work, but, um, but, you know, we, we got in this business to make movies and, and, um, and so, you know, while we certainly want the films to, to go on and do something and I'm hopeful that this film will, do something for his career and, and maybe mine as a producer. Um, you know, there is a kind of joy of making movies and, and I, I love, you know, once a film is done, like I love 
talking to you. I love going to film festivals with it. I, I just, that's probably the most joy I get out of making movies is, is having something that I really like and that I feel like other people will like and trying to find those people that will like it and trying to get it in front of them and, you know, sharing it with them and talking about it. That I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So how can people see Driver X? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, um, the uh, independent film channel, IFC, sorry, independent film channel, uh, IFC Films, which is not the independent film channel, IFC Films and their uh, label Sundance Selects is releasing the movie in theaters and on demand. Um, the uh, It's open. Opening November 30th. Um, if you're in New York or LA, you can. Uh, it'll be opening uh, at the uh, Limley Monica Film Center on the 30th in, in Los Angeles in Santa Monica, and running for a week in New York. It'll be opening at the in, uh, IFC Center, um, 30th, and running for a week. We're doing a sneak preview on November 27th, where a bunch of us are going to go fly to New York um, and be there for the uh, for this kind of sneak preview. Patrick and Henry and Tanya, our lead lead actress, plays the wife. Um, Desmond Borges is the third lead. We'll all be there. Um, and then, and then of course, uh, if you're familiar with their model, um, it'll open on VOD, um, on cable VOD and iTunes and some, a few other platforms on the 30th as well. And then we'll be announcing, um, actually, I, I, knew, I do know two other cities. It'll be opening in Santa Fe and Albuquerque on the following weekend, December 7th. And Patrick will be, because he you know works on uh, the show Better Call Saul, he'll be there to support those two screenings, nice. those two openings. Um, and uh, has a lot of support in that in those towns. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'll be opening some other cities. We haven't gotten the dates yet, um, so I don't want to say anything because it's not official. But it, you know, it'll it's a ten city minimum. It'll probably play more than ten cities. Um, and um, and uh, you know, we'll be fighting it out with uh, with a million other movies that are opening those mm-hmm. those uh, those weeks. I mean, it's frightening. I, a, a story came out in the New York Times, the LA Times, the same day. Um, the kind of Hollywood ho- holiday movie list. And um, the L.A. Times, uh, the New York Times was a curated list. It was it was what they thought the, the films they were most excited about. And we made that list. We were really happy to make that list. The L.A. Times was a comprehensive list. And I think on the 30th, there were 17 other movies coming out that same day. Um, and that's I mean, and like every weekend, there's another you know 20 movies or 18 movies. So it's, it's so difficult. Um, but, you know, we're. We, you know, our trailer just dropped yesterday. We're really happy with that. And, and, um, you know, I, I think, I think from my experience of showing the movie, you know, I'm very happy with the movie. I feel like there's an audience for it. Uh, people will relate to what's going on and, I, and the people that think they're going to like it generally like the movie, which is a nice thing too. You know, um, we've had great responses from, uh, you know, from a pretty broad range of people, but certainly the target audience, however you want to define that, um, you know, they really love the movie. And that that's that you don't always have that. Sometimes your movies are 50 50 movies where you make something and, you know, you kind of split the audience down the middle. And that a lot of independent films are like that. A lot of the best ones are like that. Um, this one's a little it's a little more, I would say, commercial. And that's not the best word probably to describe it. It's um, but it's an accessible movie. And and I think if you respond to that, you know, subject matter, if you look at the log line and you go well, this sounds interesting I, you'll pretty much like the movie it's not a overly arty film or something like that it, it's uh it's just a good piece of honest filmmaking that you know with with good performances and, and you know good writing and and it looks terrific considering you know what we were up against shooting it and all that kind of stuff so yeah yeah well perfect so what's the best way for people to keep up with you um you mentioned your your no budget film school but twitter facebook a blog anything you want to share now I yeah yeah for so the for the movie uh we're kind of re- revamping our website right now but you can find all the information you would want to know about the movie uh at the web- website which is driverxmovie.com um and again that's going to in a, I don't know, a week or something it'll look much better um we'll have a lot more stuff on there and and um but the kind of basic information is there um our handles for the movie are at driver x movie so twitter uh facebook and instagram it's it, it's at driver x movie um i'm on twitter it's at at stolaroff s t o l a r o f f um uh no budget film school is no budget film um i'm i basically tweet for for that i don't i'm not a huge social media person but um but i you know i have to tweet sometimes and i do um uh and um uh yeah i'm pretty easy to find i have a I have a website, markstolaroff.com. Again, if you spell it correctly, you'll you'll find it. Um, and you know anything I'm doing, whether it's teaching or lecturing or consulting or the movies I've done or you know whatever, that's on that website. Mm-hmm. So, 
Well, perfect, Mark. I really appreciate your coming on um, today to talk with me. Um, fascinating interview, and I wish you luck with this film and, and all your future films. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. It's been my pleasure, and I really appreciate you having me on. No problem. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high-quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three-pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly Best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is a monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Just a quick shout out to screenwriter Jody Ellis. He just optioned a screenplay through SYS Select through the SYS Select screenplay database to a very experienced producer. Congratulations, Jody. And thank you, Jody, for emailing me to tell me about your success story. I added a little blurb about the option to the SYS success page. So if you want to learn a little more about it, just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. And there's a number of success stories on there. And um, once again, big congratulations to Jody for, for getting an option through the SYS Select database. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Paulina Lagudi. She is another great example of someone who started out doing short films and eventually parlayed that experience into doing a feature film. She just did a really cool family film called Male Order Monster, and we dig into that and we really talk about the nuts and bolts, how that all came together for her. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. Anyway, that's the show. Thank you for listening.